Hello, it's Raphael Gutierrez. I'm going to talk about bones, how they develop, and then talk about the uh, axial skeletal system, which includes the skull, the vertebrae, the ribs, the sternum, and I will not include the clavicles, some people do. It is made through the same way as the axial skeletal system, but it tends to work better with the appendicular. One of the things you may notice is I'm trying to keep these videos at about uh, half hour. I figure that's as long as most people can uh, handle me. If there are any questions, please, Put them in the uh, comments below and I will answer them. Uh, the other thing that I would actually ask you guys to do is if you are watching these and you are getting benefits from it, please consider subscribing. Uh, just that way you get these videos as soon as they come. But there are some that are not necessarily for uh, what you're studying. For instance, I do a lot of videos on body injuries. I do believe that by looking at them, a lot of times you may be able to understand anatomy better. If all you're interested in is the anatomy, you're not going to necessarily want to look at all the uh, videos. One of the big things that I think would help is, if you notice, every time I use a word, I use, for instance, let's say I talk about epidermis. I tell you, epi means top, dermis means skin. The reason I use that is because anatomy tends to recycle these words over and over again. If you understand how the words work, you can end up understanding what everything is named. It makes everything a lot easier. If you do have my uh, anatomy lab manual, it has places for you to put what different things mean. And hopefully that will help you. Uh, I will promote my books. Uh, off the rails is my latest one, which is a train trip. It's pretty much just a train trip I took around from uh, San Diego to Oakland area. And the other one is Serious and the Rarest Things, which is based on a trip that I took to uh, Okinawa to train in karate. Uh, these, like I usually tell people, these videos do help. These book sales do help me maintain, do these videos, have time to actually do stuff. Uh, I do have a job, regular job, which is I, I teach biology, anatomy, physiology. I've taught microbiology. I, I do have a class where I teach uh, martial arts, and I do also have my own uh, martial arts school here in San Diego. There are some people who have talked about, uh, asked me if I consider doing uh, guest lectures. I have, I really am interested in doing that. If you are interested in having me talk, talk to you about any subject, uh, either biology, travel, uh, dream related. What I mean is uh, fulfilling your own uh, dreams. I'm more than willing to do that. Uh, just send me an email and we'll discuss uh, the price. Thank you and I hope you enjoy this video. So before I begin talking about bones, I do have to talk a little bit about the embryology. And one thing you might remember is initially started as a giant cell which went through cleavage giving you something called the morula. And you could watch this again. The morula ended up giving you two cell layers. One ended up forming the blast. The other one ended up forming the inner cell mass. The inner cell mass ended up baking two layers. One was called the epidermis. I'm sorry, epiblast. Underneath it, the hypoblast. And remember, this is inside a sphere. So, the epiblast and hypoblast are two cell layer sphere, which is called a bilaminar disc, together. What ends up happening is the epiblast starts growing faster than the hypoblast. And what ends up happening is you then end up having three cell layers. You have the epiblast, the uh, ectoderm, I'm sorry, the mesoderm and the endoderm. Remember, these words mean something. Ecto means outer, meso means middle, endo means inside. And these two start growing even faster. Now, one thing going back to this picture, the fluid in here, which is a fluid-filled cavity, is the amnion. And the fluid in here is a yolk. So you have the amniotic sac and the yolk sac. And as this grows around, you have your endoderm forming here, your mesoderm forming around that, and your ectoderm forming around that. Now the reason I left a little space is when this is happening, your yolk sac is still here. But most of the things that are around it are your amnionic fluid. So the, this part down here becomes the inside, the outer layer stays the outside. So now we have three cell layers. 
And what I just want to look at is the three cell layers here. Now, what ends up happening is in the mesoderm here, we'll put this meso, you end up having a condensation of cells. You have a bunch of cells forming a specialized structure called a notochord. Now, once you form the notochord, the notochord pulls, it pulls on the ectoderm. And it causes the ectoderm to fold and eventually come into the mesoderm, forming a tube inside the mesoderm. So you got ectoderm tube, you have your mesoderm, and then you have your endoderm tube around that. So this would be your endoderm here, right here. This would, everything around it would be your mesoderm. And on top of that, you have another layer of ectoderm. So in essence, what you've done is you made a tube inside this organism with two tubes. And so that tube will no longer be, will now be called the neural tube. And you still have the notochord. And you have other cells that came in with it on the side here, which are called neural crest cells. And you still have the notochord. Now remember, this would be dorsal, this would be ventral, this would be the top, bottom. So you're actually developing like a worm right now. Now, you also have a collection of cells here, and on the other side here too, called the som. So you have an area here called the somite. And the somite is going to do certain things. I'm going to actually get a new piece of paper after I do this, because what you have is you have three layers to the somite. One of them, this one over here, is called, going to be called your sclerotome. Sclero means hard, tome means layer. The reason that that's important is the sclerotome is going to move around the neural tube to form something hard. So the sclerotome is going to go around the neural tube. At the same time, you're going to start developing limb buds. And you're going to start forming muscles. But what I'm actually looking at is the uh, pretty much just the skeletal system. So one of the things that happens is you start forming cartilage here as well. Now, the cartilage will end up be making a structure that's similar to bone. And it will end up forming in a way where you will actually have an organism that looks like a salamander. So your hands will be pointing outward. So if we were going to do the, we'd have the head area here, the neural tube here, the gut tube here, and we'd have the arms coming out like this, thumb here, same thing here, out here. And the legs would have the same shape. Now that's actually going to be really important, especially when we start talking about muscles. And I know it looks kind of like uh, one of the uh, Pixar characters right now. Uh, so that's actually what we're going to talk about is how these things are done. Now the first thing that happens is, like I said, around your brain and spinal cord, you start making bone. Now that is a type of ossification called in... That's a type of ossification called intra... Membranous. And in that, in that case, what happens is you form a mesenchymal membrane around the brain and spinal cord, and you start making bone directly into it. You have a cell called an osteoblast, which makes bone. What ends up happening is first you end up laying down a blood vessel, a bunch of blood vessels. And around that blood vessel, you start laying down cells. Now these cells are your osteoblasts. Osteo means bone, blast means maker. Now I'm gonna turn this around so you have the central, the artery in here, a vein here as well, and a nerve here. 
and all around it you're going to form these osteoblasts. Now as you form these osteoblasts what ends up happening is they end up going through the typical uh, making of uh, protein which is transcription which is when they get their DNA and make a copy of it in RNA then translation where the RNA is copied to protein and the protein, the collagen tends to be laid down along this entire area now the other thing that happens is they start taking calcium phosphate crystals and binding them to the matrix they started. So what you end up with is you end up with the tree-like arrangements which I talked about before. Cells inside, and I talked about the lacunae, the canaliculis, the concentric lamella, central canal is here, artery, vein, nerve, and you end up forming these structures. Now, in intramembranous ossification, bone is made directly from uh, from the membrane. You don't have an intermediate step, it's just it starts being made. You do have different types of uh, tissue, which I, I'll talk, I talked about before, and I'm going to talk more about the skull bones later. Now, that's one type of ossification, and this is going to make most of the bones of the uh, axial skeleton system. And the reason this is important is if you look at the uh, skull of a uh, infant, of a newborn, you'll notice that it's actually pretty much about the size of a softball. And that has to go through the birth canal, so these you don't want the brain to be fully formed. You don't want cartilage there, so it can actually move around and reshape. That's why when you see a newborn baby who's through a normal vaginal delivery, he'll have a little cone-shaped head. If he's done through C-section, you'll have that nice little round head that people like. Uh, but don't worry about it. If you have normal vaginal delivery, the head will fix itself. You won't end up with a cone head for the rest of his life. But that's part of the reason why it is. Now, the clavicle, the bone that actually holds your sternum and your shoulder goes from your sternum to your shoulder, that's also made through intramembranous ossification. And that's why that bone tends to break a lot in childbirth. Now, the other type of ossification we have is called endochondral. Endo means inside. Chondral is cartilage. So what you end up doing in endochondral ossification is you make your bone out of cartilage. It's not really bone, it's cartilage. Then you end up forming what's known as a bone collar. Bone collar is pretty much just what it says. It's pretty much bone. Now what ends up happening is cartilage has a very poor blood supply, so the area in here begins to die off. Well, a blood vessel tries to come in, but it can't because you have bone there. So you have a cell called an osteoclast. Clast, by the way, means breaker. So osteoclast is a bone that breaks cells. And it drills a hole through bone, so an artery can come in here. And then the artery shoots up, and has a bunch of branches, and you start replacing the cartilage here with bone. And you start doing it so the bone is growing up through the cartilage. This area here is called your primary ossification. Ossification center. Uh, don't worry about that, I'll type it in later. Okay, over here, you end up having the same thing happen. And here too, these two areas, exactly the same thing happens here that happened in here. So this is your secondary ossification center, and this one too. And what ends up happening is the bone starts growing from here to here. Now, the only place the skeletal system can grow here is in this area here. Now this area is your growth plate, but we call it the ep the epiphyseal plate. And this is where it grows, here too. Both. So the long bone can only grow, the axial, uh, the appendicular bone, can only grow in the epiphyseal plate. Epi means top, so the top plate. Now bone, long bone, has actually two divisions. You can actually see actually a couple divisions. One are these long, outer areas, which is the epiphysis, and this area down here is called the diaphysis. And now we have the basic structure of bone.
And we've already talked about all the tissues. So what I'm going to talk about next is I'm going to talk about all the bones of the skull. And for that, I am going to use a picture from my lab manual. Now, before I go into that, though, there are some words I want you really need to know to understand the bones. And those are, you have to know what the word coronal means. You have to know sagittal. You have to know transverse. You have to know med medial, lateral, because I am going to use all the terms that I've talked about before. Now, for the skull, I have a really great picture. It is a fair use picture. I found it on the NIH website. And so it should be fair game to anyone. Now, this picture I drew in a little bit earlier. If you have the lab, you can actually see where it is. But one of the things I want you to see is here, you have the first bone that I'm going to talk about. It's called the frontal bone. And frontal pretty much means in the front. Over here you have your parietal. And parietal is a word that you really want to know really well. Parietal technically is usually the top. Now you remember how I talked about the, uh, uh, the, uh, ret the peritoneal membrane where you have a visceral and parietal layer. Again, the parietal layer was the outermost, so parietal here. Now, back here, you have your occipital bone. I'll rewrite it later. And then, here, you have your temporal bone. Now, one of the things to remember is temporal refers to time. And when I started going gray, I started going gray in this area, in the temporal region. Now, right now, I'm just going quickly over the bones. So you can see the temporal bone comes over here, and you have different processes. You then have this bone here, which makes the yolk of the eye. What I mean by that is, if you actually were uh, with a bull, you'd actually have this thing holding it, and it's the yolk. It looks like this, and so they call it the yolk of the eye which is called the zygomatic bone. Now, I am going through all these bones first and then I'm going to show you something, some nice processes. Past the zygomatic bone, we have a bone here. It's this way here, here. And it comes all the way down here, which is your maxilla. You then have your nasal bone Lacrimal bone, you can see part of your ethmoid bone here. And now you have most, pretty much all the bones that you can see here, except for this one here, mandible. But you also have a lot of different projections that you can find. Now I'm going to talk about what a process is. A process is pretty much an extension of bone. And for some of them, they're named after the bone they touch. What I mean by that is this. Here you have the temporal bone, and you have this process going to the zygomatic. So this area here is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Over here, you have an extension of the zygomatic bone, which is going to the temporal bone. So it's a temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Here you have the zygomatic bone, which is touching the frontal, so it's a frontal process of the zygomatic bone. Over here you have the zygomatic bone, it's touching the maxilla, so it's a frontal process of the mac... Uh, sorry. So here you have the zygomatic bone, and you have the maxilla, and so you have the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone, front, the zygomatic process of the frontal bone, the zygomatic process of the maxilla, ma the frontal process of the maxillary bone. And so you can see how all these bones come together. Now, we've actually talked about all these projections, and there's a couple more. So there are some projections that look like a spine. So here we have a little spine called the nasal spine. Anytime you have a, pro a pointy pr projection, it's going to be a spine, regardless to where it is. Now, there are a couple different things that are, that are important to know. For instance, over here you have this long pointy projection that to someone looked like a stylus, which is a writing instrument. So you have your styloid process. Anytime you see 
a stylus, remember, anything that looks like a writing instrument is going to be a styloid process. This on the temporal bone also is going to be your mastoid process. This area here, to someone, look like a breast. And so they called it the mastoid process. By the way, it's also the reason why ships have masts, the breast shape. Okay. Now, when you hold the teeth together, it doesn't matter if it's a maxilla or mandible, maxilla or mandible, this area here is going to be called the alveolar process. Both of them, this one here and this one here, are both alveolar processes. Alveolar means air. Now, the interesting thing is where you have these areas where teeth come in, you do have hollow, a hollow area where the teeth used to be. And it is a site that fractures can occur. It's called the Lefort's type 1. You can also have different types of Lefort's fractures, but for that you can watch the video. And different parts of the bone will have different names. And I'm going to let you go through that. Uh, it's actually easier for you to use a lab. Now, now that we have all the parts of the skull, one of the things I do want to mention is what are called the sutures. Now, one thing to remember is, remember the boards we used before. This suture here between the frontal and parietal, suture is pretty much just where two bones come together. If you had a crown, the main thing would be on that side. So we call that suture the coronal suture. Over here, you have another suture called the lambdoid suture. And it's called the lambdoid because it's between the occipital and parietal, but it ends up looking like this, like a Greek lambda. And over here, we have, again, it's a suture in the flat area, so we call it the squamous suture. And it separates the parietal from the frontal, I'm sorry, parietal from the, uh, parietal from the temporal, and the zygomat, the senoid from the parietal and frontal. And you have an area here which makes an H pattern, where the frontal the temporal and the parietal all come to, and the sphenoid all come together, making an H type pattern, which is called the terion. Now this area here is called the uh, the glabella. The other thing to remember, and there's a video that shows these sinuses a lot better, is you have areas which have hollow casings here, hollow areas. And so this is a frontal sinus, sphenoid sinus is back here, maxillary sinus is here. And so you also have those. And uh, there is one other suture I want to show you, and that's at the top of the head, if I can find you, if I put the picture on. Are you sure I did? Nope. That's not. Well, there's a suture on the top of the head called the mid-sagittal, the sagittal suture. And it just goes, if you have the frontal bone here, parietal bones here, and the occipital bone here, it's just line here is the sagittal suture. And again, if you think of the arrow, it would follow the path of an arrow. Now next time I'm going to talk about the appendicular system, but that's later. Besides that, we can turn the skull around, and I'm going to use the other picture. And we can look at the eye itself. And so here you can see the picture. Again, this is a fair use picture. I modified it. You can see the nasal bone here. The maxilla here. Over here you have the the uh, lacrimal, the ethmoid would be here. You have the sphenoid, palatine bone here, zygomatic bone comes around here. Let's see. And what you have is you have these two big cavities, which are called fissures. This is your superior orbital fissure. This will be your inferior. And this hole here is your optic canal. Now, if you notice, Superior means top, inferior means bottom, and that's why the, these things do. It is important to know all these different uh, names. Now, you also, I should also mention, you have two holes. One is above the eye, one is below the eye. The one above the eye is, again, superior or supra, orbital, foramen, and foramen just means hole. That would make this one the infraorbital foramen. Now, I'm going to move to another area. Hopefully you can see this. This is actually one of my pictures. And what you see is you see the nasal cavity. Now here, in the nasal cavity, you see a split, which we call the nasal septum. 
Now, the, the nasal septum is actually divided into two bones. The top bone, uh, bone up here is called your is part of your ethmoid bone. It's a bone called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The bottom bone here is called your vomer. And again, you can see the inferior orbital fissure there. You can also see different things coming off of it. And this picture kind of didn't come out too well because it should be over here. You actually will have three areas where three lumps, which are called the nasal turbinates. And you'll get to see those later. It's easier to see them in bones, but those are actually some of the other things that are really important. Now, here we are. This is a maxilla, and the reason I want to talk about the maxilla is you now have another projection here and here. These are two rounded wheel-like projections, which are called the condyles. Now the condyles are attached to the head, and then you have this area here, which is called the neck. The other projection that's important is this one here, which is called your coracoid process. You do also have your ramus, your angle, your body, and uh, if you and you've already talked about the rest of the stuff. Now, there are a lot of different ways to look at the skull. A lot of these things are better to look at with uh, a skull in front of you. There are some apps that are important that are actually really worthwhile, and some of these projections you can see over and over again. Some of them are hard to see. For instance. In a picture like this, you can see these two rounded projections here and here, which are the condylar processes. You can see this big hole here, which is your foramen, foramen magnum. You can see two lines here, one here and one here, which are called the nuchal lines. Over here, we've already talked about the mastoid process. You see the styloid. And you have a little hole between the mastoid and styloid. Uh, which is a cellomaso foramen. You can see the uh, what's known as the zygomatic arch. Over here, you have one other bone that we haven't talked about. It would actually be here. This here, entire area here, is your maxilla. And back here, you have your palatine bones. You can see part of your vomer up here, too. And you can see holes, uh, canals that go through there. Again, this is easier to see in a whole model. And I'm going quick because I figure it really doesn't make sense for me to point out stuff that you're not going to be able to see. Now, the other part I'm actually going to talk about is this area here. Now, I've talked about a bone called the sphenoid a few times, and you can see it here. You can also see part of it down here. So what you see is you see these two bat wing type things. And so you have the lesser wing, which is this area here and the greater wing down here. And these will form the sphenoid bone. Over here, you have something that looks like a chair, which we call the cella tersica, and the pituitary sits right here. You can also see where the optic canals are here, and that's one of the, that's an arrangement that ends up having problems. This is again, foramen magnum. And you have a lot of different areas that I can talk about. You can actually talk about this area here, which looks like a rock, which is called the petrous portion. of the temporal bone. You also have a part called the squamous portion, which if you remember, squamous means flat, and it's this area here. It's a flat area of the, uh, from temp the squamous portion of the temporal bone here. This, the temporal sulcus is there. This is the squamous portion is here. It's a flat area. You also can see a hole here, which is the external acoustic meatus. Now, I know I jumped around on that. You do have an internal acoustic meatus, and you have certain holes that are named for what they look like. For instance, that one here is oval, so we call it foramen ovalis. Again, oval, uh, foramen means hole. It's foramen spinosum here, and you can see some of the foramen uh, rotundum here. So you are going to be able to see a lot of holes in the skull, and I'm going to keep it at that. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is this bone here. Narrow it down a little. What you can see is I am using a lot of the uh, 
fab which tells you certain things. Now, when you look at this, this here here is anterior, meaning the front. This here is posterior. And if you look at the curvature, normal curvature of the skull of the spinal cord would go concave, convex, concave. And that's a curvature. And each area has a special name. The area of the neck, which would be up here, is a cervical. The area of the chest area is the thoracic. This area here is the lumbar, sacrum, and this little tail here is coccyx. Yes, you do have a tailbone, which is at the bottom. Now, neat thing is, a lot of people have used this, and I figure it's fair use. There are ways to remember how many vertebrae are in each uh, bone. Now, these are really important, especially when we start going into neuro. Because what we have is cervical, we have 12. We have seven cervical bones. Thoracic, we have 12. And lumbar, we have five. Sacrum, we have five fused. Uh, coccyx, we have one. Well, we have five fused coccyx, but usually there's only going to be one nerve there. And so that's actually the bones. Now, each bone of the spinal of the spine is going to be slightly different. I'm going to start with this one here first. And this is a lumbar. One of the things you notice is this area here, which is called the body, is huge. The foramen, vertebral foramen, which is here, is relatively small. And you can see that you have these projections here, which are called transverse processes, superior articulate facets, inferior articulate facets, and the spiny projection called the spine. Superior articulate. Now, this is the most generic of the vertebrates because the other ones have something slightly different. When we come to this one here, which is a thoracic, you'll notice it has an extremely long spine. The hole's a bit bigger. But the important thing about this is you have three different areas here, 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 where ribs come and touch. So we talk about costal facets. Costal means ribs. So this would be superior costal, inferior costal, and transverse costal facets. And that's how these things come together. The costal facets is what makes the thoracic vertebrae different than the other ones. And over here we have a typical cervical. We have our body again, the vertebral canal, performant. We have a bifid spine, meaning it splits in two, superior articular facets, and inferior. Those are the typical. Now cervical especially have two that are not typical. And so for that, I'll move over here. The first one is C1, cervical vertebrae 1, which is called the atlas. If you remember, atlas holds up the world. As far as you're concerned, cervical vertebrae 1 is, your, is what's holding up your world. And again, you see these two little holes, which are going to be called transverse foramen, you have the vertebral foramen, and what you notice is you're missing the body. There's no body here. Not like this one, just to show you. This one here has a body, this one doesn't. You do have superior uh, articulate facets, which are for the dens. We have inferior for the vertebrae underneath. And it's missing the dens. The reason it's missing the dens is the dens in embryology broke off and joined C2, which is the other really big atypical which is called atlas. Now atlas is uh, something made to rotate. And so here you can see the atlas and axis would fuse together and it will allow the head to move back and forth. You have the same projections you have in other cervical vertebrae, so I'm going to leave it at that. And then you have the sacrum over here. You have the sac medial sacral crest, lateral sacral crest, coccyx is down here. You have uh, the foramen, foramina, you have all the things that you find in typical cervical vertebrae. And then you have your sternum, which is this area here. It's made of three parts. Manubrium is the top part, body is the second, xiphoid process is the third. Now, this area joining here is really important because you can feel it. And if you look at this, when you feel that it's that lump, that joint, which is called the sternal angle, 
it gives it always hits the second rib. The first rib is here, second rib is here. So it's actually a really good anatomical site to find the areas of the second rib so you can find where you're moving. The xiphoid process is also used as an anatomical landmark, but more importantly, it's a part that can be broken. So in CPR, they usually tell you to feel the sternal angle and come to the sternum to make sure you don't get a xiphoid process which can break. Now, we also have your ribs. And you can see this area of ribs is actually cartilage. And so we can talk about different types of ribs. Now, we talk about true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. The last two ribs are the floating ribs, and they're tiny. A lot of people tell you they break. It's really hard because they're covered with muscle and they're not attached to anything. The first, one, two, three, four, five, eight, the first eight ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, are going to be called your true ribs. Nine and ten are going to be called your false ribs because they actually join the uh, eighth rib in the same cartilage. The other ones have their own cartilage. Now, what a rib looks like. There, here you have a rib. Now you do have an angle, you have a tubercle, you have a head, neck, and you also have a groove underneath it. The groove is important because that's where your vein arteries and nerves run. And this here is called your sternal end. Now the sternal end is what attaches to cartilage. And uh, that's your rib, pretty much. The other bone that I, we can talk about is this one here, which is called your hyoid bone. Now your hyoid bone really pretty much has two horns. This big one here is a greater, this little one lesser, and the body. And that's pretty much the axial skeletal system. Except for one thing. When I drew the when I drew the uh, for the development, I told you about how you have this notochord and how it sticks around when you end up making the uh, sclerotome around the uh, ectoderm, which is going the neural tube, which is going to make the bones. Now that those bones that are made here, by the way, are going to be the skull and vertebrae. And what's neat is, we don't. Do, I didn't talk about all the bones, all the structures, but one of the things that happens is the notochord. Once you actually make the vertebrae, the notochord gets shredded into a bunch of different pieces, and that becomes a little gelatinous thing called a nucleopaposa. Around the nucleopaposa, around the nucleopaposa, you form fiber cartilage, and between the vertebrae, you also have hyaline cartilage, which we talked about. So we have fiber cartilage, hyaline cartilage, and we also have a capsule made out of dense regular connective tissue, which holds everything together. Now, when you hear about someone having a herniated disc, what it usually means is this disc here, which is called the intervertebral disc, comes out of its capsule and usually rests on nerves. And so that's why some people end up, if you move wrong, you can end up causing that uh, damage. Now, there are some videos I have on normal body structures. I, I will try to make it so it, they become easily available here. I hope you enjoy this and I will answer any questions. I didn't go through every structure, but what you notice is you have styloid process, anything that's like a stylus, mastoid process, condyles, holes are foramen. And with this, you should be able to understand what you're looking at uh, especially if you're given a list from someone who told who tells you uh, what to know. I actually have my students memorize everything, and it seems that this actually works. So thank you for your time. Goodbye.